I tried to beat Pokemon Legends Arceus under hardcore Nuzlocke rules, and to make things even spicier, I tried to beat it using only fighting type Pokemon. With a redefined battle system and one of the hardest final bosses of any Pokemon game, would it even be possible? Well, I wanted to find out. If you're not familiar with the hardcore Nuzlocke rules, if a Pokemon faints, it is dead, buried, and can never be used again. I can only catch one of each fighting type Pokemon, and if either my whole team or character faints, then the run is over and I have to start all over again. To make things even harder, I won't be able to use any items in battle, and I won't be allowed to overlevel my team. Could I beat the game with these restrictions? Well, I tried. Here's how it went. We meet God who asks for my name. Being a punching crazed fighting type trainer, I introduce myself as Mr. Fister. Apparently, I fell all the way from the heavens to the ground. That would be enough to kill a regular person, but my rock hard fighting physique can take on anything. Ooh, a message from God. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Hmm, I better do what it says. The townspeople are all too happy to send me to my death, but at least they let me pick a starter Pokemon. None of these are a fighting type, but I picked Rowlet since it does gain a fighting type in its final evolution. I gave it the nickname Crane because its final form reminds me of the character from Kung Fu Panda. Our first fight is against Volo and that smug grin of his but Rowlet turns his Togepi into scrambled eggs in no time at all. The commander challenges me to a fist fight, and naturally, I hit him with a left, right, good night, beating him sideways. But I warn you, Pokemon are terrifying creatures. He's so adorable! The Survey Corp's clothes have zero fashion sense, and I needed something more my style. Yeah, that's better. This game has an awesome roster of both new and returning fighting types. Let me know in the comments below which of these Pokemon is your favorite and I'll give my answer later on. Now, I can't grab a fighting Pokemon just yet, so my only option for the next few battles is to use Rowlet. Akari's Pikachu is up first, but it goes down pretty quickly. Mai, on the other hand, is much tougher. She has a Munchlax that knows Rollout, so this fight would be way easier if I actually had a fighting type. Rollout hits Rowlet for big damage, but my plan is to use Roost. Not only does this recover HP, but it temporarily removes my flying type, so Rollout isn't as treacherous. With this strategy, Rowlet hangs on long enough to remove Munchlax with a barrage of leafages. But with the map now opened up, it's time to get an actual fighting type Pokemon. By running all this way, I reach the Orburrow Tunnel. Machop spawns here and I can't afford to miss this encounter. So I carefully threw some berries and lined up a backstrike Pokeball throw, and this was enough to catch Mike Tyson the Matchup. I put Rowlet in the PC, so little Matchup would have to do all the heavy lifting for now. And this is a problem because my next battle is against Alpha Cricketoon. Not only does Cricketoon have great early game stats, but this one knows the flying type move Aerial Ace, which will rip my Machop apart. So I needed a plan. I realized that once you reach the 3-star rank, Zisu will teach Machop the elemental punches, and so I upgraded my moveset and stepped up to face Cricketoon. It outspeeds and, as expected, lays down an aerial ace, taking more than half of my HP. But by using Bullet Punch, I deal a small chunk of damage while also getting to move a second time in a row. With my next attack, a Fire Punch incinerates that monstrous dilly dilly whooper. My next mission is incredibly dangerous, but nothing that the chiseled body of Mr. Fister can't handle. Little Leanne tries to stop me, but one Ice Punch to Gumi's jaw sends it into the stratosphere. Now I can ride on Weird Ear, which is great, except I ran off a cliff and almost died, which would have been the end of the run right there. I'll have to be careful with that. Anyway, Leanne went and cried to his boss, Irida, so I have to teach her a lesson too. She says that her partner Pokemon is like her own sister, which makes things very awkward because I proceeded to slap her sister Glaceon right into its grave. Mr. Fister pulls no punches. Having asserted my dominance, I was about to disrespect the Pearl Clan even further by throwing food in the face of their noble lord Cleavor. But being the hardened warrior that I am, I took it on in hand-to-hand -hand combat and slapped it silly. It didn't even hit me once. I beat it up, took its lunch money, and its stupid plate. Oh, you're Mr. Fister, aren't you? Uh, obviously, can't you tell by my ripped arms and shredded body? Akari challenges me to a rematch, and she's now got a Mr. Mime, which is a pest with its psychic and fairy typing. Fortunately, I do have an answer for it, as two super effective bullet punches take Mime Jr. down. Last is Pikachu, and while it does land a paralysis, one powerful fire punch gives me the win. Akari gives me the recipe for stealth sprays, but who needs stealth when you have these giant muscles? But with that, I've now got access to the Crimson Mire Lands, as well as a few extra encounters. First up is Krogunk, who I'm able to catch straight away. For my next encounter, I head to the Northern Ruins, where I'm able to find a male role nicknamed McGregor. But this presents a dilemma, as to evolve Curlia into Gallade, I need a Dawnstone. I knew I could buy one in Jubilife for 1200 merit points, so I collected a bunch of satchels. 
Problem is, they spawn really slowly, so I shifted to breaking ores as I knew that some stones could be gained through this method. This gave me zero luck, so I turned to the last method I knew of. Space-time distortions. I found a lot of junk, and the game even taunted me by giving me some shiny stones. But then, I found something. Not a Dawnstone, but a Pokemon Heracross. I didn't even realize that it could spawn here, so I guess this grind wasn't all bad. There's no context here, I just wanted to share this goofy Psyduck chasing its tail and trying to whip up a tornado. Anyway, I continued grinding over the next few hours until I finally found... a Sunstone. Ah! Look, did I absolutely need a Gallade to proceed? Probably not, but I wasn't confident enough to risk the entire run on that, so I pressed onwards. And after a stupid amount of time, I finally got the Dawnstone, shoved it up Curlia's butt, and we finally had our Gallade. You better be worth that grind. What you did to Cleavor was hardly different from bullying a Pokemon into submission. Yep, I was pretty great, huh? If this old lady keeps giving me sass, I'll be sending her to the retirement village in the sky. Volo wants to see my strength, so I unleashed Gallade and picked up a quick win within three turns. But Gallade's reign of terror was not done yet. After sniffing out the Kanker sisters, they do their big song and dance, only to be knocked out in one move. I almost feel sorry for them. I return the stolen artifact, and my reward is a mauling at the hands of Ursa Luna. This guy is a huge threat. Its stats are through the roof, and it can single-handedly end a run on its own. I doubt I can knock it out in one turn, so I have Gallade use Bulk Up on turn 1 to boost both my offense and defense. An agile baby doll eyes from Ursa Luna removes my attack boost before Play Rough leaves me with about a third of my HP. But on the next turn, a super effective Drain Punch does more than half of Ursa Luna's health while also recovering Gallade. Even after another baby doll eyes, I was confident that I could pick up the kill with another Drain Punch, but fell just short. I was risking a critical hit here, but fortunately, Ursa Luna didn't land one, and one more attack on the next turn was able to finish the fight. Okay, I can breathe a big sigh of relief now because that fight horrified me. A fight that I'm not so worried about is against the noble lord Lilligan. Its attacks are pretty basic, although it did manage to hit me once, so I guess it fared better than Cleavor. But ultimately, the intense throws dished out by my rock-hard arms were too much for Lilligan to handle. Down by the beach, Kamado welcomes the newcomers to the village. Hey, wait a minute. Why don't they have to complete any trials? Silene tried to kill me and these guys get a free ride? What a joke. With a new level cap, I'm able to evolve Machop into Machoke, which is pretty great. But what's even better is I can use one of the link cables that I found in space-time distortions to evolve it into Machamp immediately. That's a lot of fists. The perfect Pokemon for Mr. Fister. I can also head back to the Crimson Mylands where I'm able to catch a Petalil. I purposely avoided this encounter earlier as it was above the level cap. After catching Chi Chi the Petalil, I can use that Sunstone from earlier to evolve it into the new Lilligant form, which gains a secondary fighting type. Our upgraded team was looking pretty fresh, and I was now cleared to tackle the Cobalt Coastlands. But before I can do that, Irida ambushes me and demands a battle. We're at number 2 to 1 here, but her Glaceon is the real threat, so I focused on that. With a big drain punch to the jaw, I sucked its HP dry. Last is poor little level 15 Eevee who was punched into next week by Machamp. Irida insists on healing my Pokemon, but uh, I think your Pokemon need that a little more than mine do. In terms of a Nuzlocke, the next few missions in this area don't really offer much. Of course, besides Polina's fluffy good boys and the weird forbidden love subplot. Anyway, a short time later, I give Basca Legion a meal, and now Mr. Fister can take to the seas. But then, the Misfortune sisters commit the worst crime imaginable. Stealing a puppy. Not even Satan himself would stoop that low. Um, Clover, just, just checking, but are you wearing pants? Now, I will go and save Growlithe, but I have some very important business to handle first. Ooh, monkey! Chimchar spawns on an island only accessible by Basca Legion, so I backtracked to the first area and caught one. Once it evolved into Monferno, my team was ready. After crossing the sea to Fire Pit Island, we catch up with the Misfortune Sisters. This is one of the deadliest parts of the game because we have to take on all three of them back to back. First up is Clover, who has the genius idea of sending out a bomber snow next to an active volcano. Although, one four times effective fire punch reminds her that a bomber snow does not deal well with fire. Next is Coin, who still has a Toxicroak. It's extremely weak to Psychic, so a Psycho Cut immediately finishes it off. Last is Charm, and I've got to give her some credit because at least she's smart enough to carry more than one Pokemon. Her Rhydon isn't overly threatening, but I am worried about the Gengar in the back, so I set up a bulk up with Gallade on turn 1. Rhydon takes around half of my health, 
but a booster drain punch on the next turn takes it down in one shot while also recovering my HP. My boost put me in a good position to tank a hex from Gengar, before busting that ghost with a strong style, super effective psycho cut. And as punishment for their crimes, we let them escape. Radio then. That's one of the dangerous battles taken care of, and man, I'm really glad that I took the time to get that Dawnstone. But I had another scary prospect right ahead, Noble Arcanine. This is probably the boss that I historically struggle with the most. I was confident, but in saying that, I'd never beaten it on my first try. And under my Nuzlocke rules, if my character faints, then the run is over. So needless to say, I was a little nervous. The first stage of the fight was very clean. My dodges were perfectly timed, and I was in a nice rhythm. But around the halfway point, I took a big hit, and then another one soon after. My health was getting low, and I was on the brink of death, but I kept my composure. As Arcanine began charging its ult, I had just enough HP to survive a roll through the fire and the flames before barely finishing Arcanine off. That was way too close for comfort. Get me off this damn island. With the increased level cap, we upgraded the team a little bit. First, both Krogunk and Monferno were able to evolve into their final forms, Toxicroak and Infernape. Finally, I also reintroduced Rowlet into the team, subbing out Lilligan. Decidueye gains a fighting type after evolving into its final form. Having lost its flying type, Decidueye joins the ranks of chickens and penguins as a bird who cannot fly. Adaman insists on witnessing the strength of Mr. Fista, so he's about to cop a beating. Using our new Infernape, Goku, a flamethrower cooks his leafy on medium well. The little Eevee tries, but Infernape can easily finish it off with a drain punch. Or a drain kick, I guess? You know, Ingo's a bit like you. Oh, really? He licks rocks to steal their strength too? Uh, no, Mr. Fista, that's... that's just you. This quest brings us to the Coronet Highlands, where Melly continues to cement his place as the most annoying character in the game. He uses a stinky skunk tank, which is very fitting. This battle is pretty risk-free, as two bulldozers from Infernape are able to take it down, although Melly will be back with a stronger team pretty soon. For now, we continue rolling through the mountainside with Ingo. This lady somehow heals a bronzor of its injuries, but like, how does that even work? Do you just spit on it and shine it up? Now, I'm no doctor, but that boy is just a floating bit of metal. After catching up with Ingo, he decides to test my strength, and this fight is deadly. He leads with a Machoke, so naturally, I go Gallade and take it down with a super effective Psycho Cut. But next is Gliscor, and this is where things get dicey. It hits me with a Quick Attack and Aerial Ace, leaving Gallade with only a quarter of its health. I can't afford to risk Gallade, so switch into Machamp, who tanks an Aerial Ace a little bit better. Now, I was confident that a 4 times effective Ice Punch would destroy Gliscor, but I was wrong, and then this happened. Machamp barely hung on. I could finish Gliscor, but with the way the new battle system works, Machamp would undoubtedly be killed by Ingo's final Pokemon. So I make sure to switch into Toxicroak first, before finishing Gliscor with Venoshock. Last up is Tangler, and one more super effective Venoshock seals the win in what was definitely my closest battle yet. From here, the game was only going to get tougher. Help me! While climbing cliffs, I came across a Sneasel, whose new form is a fighting and poison type. Naturally, I tried to catch it, but this could have been bad. It's a pretty high level and boosted its attack with Swords Dance. I was going to run from it and try again in a different spot, but fortunately it stayed in the ball. So we'd caught Sneasel and it even dropped me a Razor Claw, which is very lucky. But what's not so lucky is that Melly's back and his bad attitude has not improved. He challenges me to a rematch and this is harder than our first battle because this one is a three on one. I lead with Infernape and my plan is to take Skuntank out first since it's by far the most dangerous. A Bulldozer does big damage, but unfortunately, so does Poison Jab and Melly poisoned Infernape. While I could finish Skuntank with Bulldoze, I was worried about a Venoshock wing attack combo from the other two henchmen. So I switched Infernape out and went into Toxicroak, who was able to finish Skuntank off with Earth Power. Zubat put Toxicroak to sleep, so I switched once more, bringing out Machamp, who was able to clean up Zubat with Ice Punch, followed by Skaroopy with Fire Punch. That could have gone worse, but I think I handled it pretty well. Even in defeat, Melly tries to mess me around. He's lucky that Adaman intervened, because Mr. Fista was about to give Melly the fist, if you catch my drift. Now it's time to take on Electrode. If Arcanine is my most feared boss, Electrode is probably my second. It gets very chaotic as there's bombs going off and electric balls chasing me. My goal was to chip it down slowly while carefully dodging the barrage of attacks. It took a while, however, it did work well. 
I took a few hits in the process, but managed to calm that big angry nut. It still looks very angry, but it isn't glowing anymore, so I guess that's job done. Melly is devastated, which makes me even more proud of my work. Once back in the village, I subbed out Toxic Croak for Sneasel, which I then evolved into Sneasler. Seriously though, this thing just looks like a Sneasel that went through some kind of medieval stretch torture. The reason for this change is simply that I just wanted to try Sneasler out. And I was going to get my chance right away as Akari challenges me to a rematch. Now, she leads with Mr. Mime, whose psychic and fairy typing is enough to send a shiver down the spine of any fighting type trainer. Fortunately, a poison jab from Sneasler is enough to take it down in one shot, but this leaves me exposed to the star Ravia that follows, who went for Brave Bird and... I had to risk Sneasler there, but it worked out okay as I just hung on. After switching into Machamp, one Ice Punch blasts Staravia out of the sky, and a few Muck Punches pummel Pikachu into the ground. These battles are starting to get very dangerous. My next stop is the wintry Alabaster Icelands. There's a lot of Pokemon here, but only one that I'm after. After luring it with some berries, I safely caught Riolu. It's staying in the PC for now, but this little guy plays a big part in my plan for this run. For now, it's on with the main quest where I meet Garrick and his pathetic scrawny body. Your physique is insulting to the chiseled, rock-hard work of art that is the body of Mr. Fister. He tries to battle, but Infernape quickly hits his ice-type duo with a left, right, good night to establish my dominance as the toughest Fister in the land. Before going further, we had some tough battles ahead, so I subbed Riolu into the team. To evolve it, I need to raise its happiness, and to do that, I need to break rocks. It's a bit tedious for me, but I guess it makes Riolu happy. Anyway, a short time later, we had a fresh new Lucario. Lucario's secondary steel typing makes it a great addition to my fighting team because it's neutral to both psychic and flying, which the rest of my team really struggles with. Apparently, Sabi can help me to fly, but it's not working. Come on, take flight. I watched my life flash before my eyes as this Gallade tried to slaughter me. After catching up with Sabi, she wants to battle and activates her hacker mode, sending out three tanky Pokemon at once. The Rhyperia in the middle is the most dangerous, so I lead with Decidueye and take advantage of its low special defense, removing Rhyperia with a four times effective Magical Leaf. In the process, Decidueye is hit by Flamethrower, so I switch into Machamp. There may be two enemies, but Machamp has two sets of arms to dish out two servings of us us directly to their jaws. Two quick KOs give me the win, but we're not out of the woods yet. Remember how I said that our team doesn't cope well with Psychic and Flying Pokemon? Well, our next opponent is both of those. Almost like it was custom built to counter Mr. Fister. However, I do have a secret weapon in Lucario who has at least a neutral matchup. On turn one, a Shadow Ball brings Braviary to low HP. It does recover some of the damage with Roost, but not enough as a second Shadow Ball on the next turn clips the wings of that horrifying bird. That ended up being pretty smooth with Lucario, but it would have been a very different story if I didn't have our new Steel-type friend. And so, I was now faced with the final Noble Lord. He's a big boy, but that's just how Mr. Fister likes him. I utterly embarrassed this giant oaf. I was floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee, and just generally slapping him around like I'm his daddy. It didn't even hit me once, so without much trouble, the final noble lord had been quelled and probably disrespected a little bit too. The next section of the game is very dialogue and story heavy. But in short, the sky lights up like it's New Year's Eve and the commander decided that that's my fault. I can't say I blame him because Mr. Fister is the only one powerful enough to pull off something like this. All right, fine, I'll leave the village. Just let me grab my protein powder. You monsters, let me in. In our quest to fix things, we have to travel to each of the Sinnoh Lakes and take on the alpha Pokemon that guard them. First up is Gudra and this thing looks miserable, probably because it knows that it's weak against my fighting type moves. Gudra missed its first attack, which didn't help its cause, and after setting up a bulk up, Machamp quickly puts Gudra out of its misery. Next is Zorok, who hits very hard, but it's also very frail. As such, I'm confident in Lucario's ability to one-shot, and it does just that with a strong style crunch. That's two down, and the final Alpha Guardian is Overquill, who's just begging for a nice big hug. I subbed Toxicroak into the team for this battle, as Overquill has a low special defense and a weakness to ground moves. Toxicroak tanks a double edge, and by using an agile style move first, I can move twice in a row. This lets me land two earth powers, popping that oversized puffer fish. With that, I'd completed all three of the Lake Trio trials, and am rewarded with a sparkly chain of red rocks. Which, no, Mr. Fister did not lick them. Next, I'll have to climb Mount Coronet, and the battles that await are easily the toughest yet. 
The first of these is Benny, who has a very scary team, boasting both a Gallade and Gardevoir, making this really tricky for my fighting types. I lead Lilligant and use Victory Dance, which boosts all of my stats. Miss Magius does make me drowsy with Hypnosis, but with my buffs, an Agile-style Leaf Blade takes it down. Gardevoir is next, and this is the biggest threat on Benny's team. A Psychic does enormous damage. Since it's drowsy, Lilligant isn't guaranteed to land an attack. I contemplated whether or not to switch it out, but decided I had to take the risk as Gardevoir is just too dangerous. Luckily, Leaf Blade does land, finishing off that deadly Gardevoir. A Leaf Blade on the next turn also finishes Gallade. However, Benny's last Pokemon, Sneasler, does finally execute Lilligant. From here, a few bulldozers from Heracross are able to finish things off, giving me a very relieving win. Losing Lilligant there was a shame, but part of me was relieved to lose only one Pokemon there, as that could have been a lot worse. I gave Lilligant a fitting burial before making some team changes and heading back up the mountain. We come face to face with Kamado, all decked out in armor, but you'll need more than that to survive a punch on with Mr. Fister. This is another deadly fight, as Kamado leads with Braviary. I didn't use Lucario in the last fight, as I needed to preserve it for this match. Up. Lucario fires off a Shadow Ball, which falls just short of getting a KO, but Kamado decides to switch into Snorlax. I know that Snorlax has high horsepower, NZ Headbutt, making it a huge threat. I decided that my best bet was a switch into Machamp due to its reasonable bulk. I set up with Bulk Up before Snorlax hits me with two attacks in a row, taking about half of my health. But a booster drain punch to Snorlax's gut on the next turn takes it out while recovering me back to full HP. Next is Clefable, who's pretty scary to begin with, but even more so after it sets up a Calm Mind. My best option with Machamp is to use Bullet Punch, which hits for super effective damage while also also raising my movement speed. This works well, but Kamado, being the coward that he is, breaks the Nuzlocke rules and uses a max potion. After another bullet punch and resetting up bulk up, Psychic hits me pretty hard. But at this point, I decided I was all in with Machamp and committed to finishing Clefable off with two more bullet punches. This absolutely should have been the end of Machamp, as Braviary was about to send it to its grave, but I got really lucky as Espawing missed. Braviary was probably distracted by Machamp's monstrous back muscles, but with one more bullet punch, Braviary was gone for good. Kamado's final Pokemon is Golem, a giant lickable rock. It dishes out some decent damage, but a few drain punches from Machamp seal the win. Having established my dominance, I made Kamado bend down and eat the dirt. Big mouthfuls now. How's it taste? Delicious, sir. That a boy. After summoning the big bad god of time, we engage in battle and... Whoops, I killed it. I'll need to catch Dialga, so we battle again. This time, I weaken it with Machamp before switching into Decidueye. Dialga breaks out of the first ball, but Decidueye's Roost can recover HP, buying me more time to throw balls. Luckily for me, the catch rate on this thing is pretty high, so I was able to get it on the next turn. Palkia arrives, and while searching for a way to stop it, we're ambushed one last time by the Misfortune Sisters. I'll have to take on Charm, who weirdly enough has the exact same team as last time. I was planning to sweep with Gallade, but after taking Rhydon out with Drain Punch, Gengar made me drowsy with Hypnosis and did big damage with Shadow Ball. Not wanting to risk Gallade, I switched into Heracross, who was able to bury Gengar with a few bulldozers. The plan to stop Palkia revolves around this ball made of shiny rocks that looks very tasty. And after returning to Spear Pillar, we're faced by the love child of Palkia and Ponyta. But I was operating at full power, I did take one hit, but the devastating power and agility of Mr. Fister was too much for even a god to handle. After only one minute, I'd slapped Palkia around and entrapped it inside the Origin Ball. With that, the day was saved and the credits rolled. All the clans gathered to celebrate and watch Kamado eat more dirt. Hang on, I'm not done just yet. Look, Nuzlocke generally ended the credits, but Legends Arceus had some crazy post-game battles, and I was determined to find out just how far this team could go. The post-game quest is centered around getting the remaining elemental plates. The first one is obtained by beating up a powerful Vesper Quen. It knows flying-type moves, so I made sure to lose Lucario, who had no trouble taking it down. The next fight is much more difficult, though, as we need to rematch Kamado, and his team is even more powerful this time. On the plus side, he now leads with Golem, which is easy for me to set up on. After setting up a strong style bulk up with Machamp, Golem removes about a quarter of my health, but one Drain Punch crushes Golem while recovering my HP. Clefable's Psychic is deadly, but a super effective boosted Poison Jab takes it down. Snorlax has great coverage against my team, with Zen Headbutt placing Machamp below half HP. Although, fortunately, a Drain Punch on Snorlax's big gut takes it down, all while giving me a huge dose of HP back. Braviary is a demon, landing a critical hit Esper Wing. 
I have to take it down quickly, as my bulk up boost is about to wear off. A super effective Ice Punch does just that, although it does leave my Machamp exposed. Kamado's last Pokemon is a Heracross, who is looking very dangerous after it sets up Swords Dance. But after a switch into Gallade, two quad effective Aerial Aces are enough to seal the win, and you know what that means, Kamado. Who's hungry for some dirt? The next few plates are obtained by catching legendary Pokemon. These obviously have huge stats, powerful moves, and are at level 70, so this can be very dangerous. Except I have a plan. See, the legendary Pokemon will aggro you as soon as you enter their rooms, but by using items to stun them, you can create openings to then catch them in the overworld. This is a huge benefit as it means I don't have to risk losing my Pokemon by battling these tough opponents. And so, I was able to catch Azelf, Yuxi, and Meesprit, as well as Heatran and Cresselia all pretty quickly. The last legendary to catch is Regigigas, and this is the only one that you actually have to engage in battle. This poor giant got absolutely screwed. Even in a game with no abilities, it still can't shake off its slow start, which is hard-coded into the game. It's got Zen Headbutt and deadly normal type attacks, so I led with Lucario. Two Muck Punches got it reasonably low, before I was fortunate enough to catch it in the first Ultra Ball. Now, Mr. Fista had just caught some disgusting non-fighting type Pokemon. Gross, I know. To set things right, I immediately released those yucky and pathetic Pokemon. Cogito gives me the penultimate plate, and in no time at all, we climb Spear Pillar, where Volo reveals his evil intentions, and even worse, his frosted tip hairdo. Now, this fight is insanely hard. Volo's team is stacked, and he basically has eight Pokemon. By no means would this be easy, but I did have a plan. His Spiritomb lead is dangerous because it has psychic coverage. So I lead Lucario, who has a decent matchup, and land two Agile-style bulldozers. I'm put to sleep in the process, but that's totally fine. Lucario's job was merely to do some chip damage and lower Spiritomb's speed with bulldoze. It's now safer to switch into Infernape and set up a strong-style bulk up. I take some damage before finishing Spiritomb with Shadow Claw. Garchomp is next, but my bulk up and Drain Punch combo allows me to recover more HP than Garchomp can remove. Within a few turns, Garchomp falls and my health is fully recovered. My stat buffs have now worn off, and next up is Togekiss. It has Psychic and Fairy coverage, which is dangerous for my team, especially after it sets up a Calm Mind. While Lucario could handle it, Volo's own Lucario, or Arcanine, would likely get the trade, and I really want to preserve Lucario. So, I decided to stay in with Infernape, set up another bulk up, and go for a Poison Jab. Sadly, this wasn't enough to get the KO, and an Air Slash from Togekiss extinguished Infernape's flames. Since Togekiss had just used a strong style move, I've now got two turns up my sleeve. This allows Machamp to set up a bulk up, before finishing the hit on Togekiss with a Poison Jab straight to the jaw. Lucario goes down to a Drain Punch, and the Roserade that follows falls to an Ice Punch. Arcanine does solid damage with Raging Fury, but a boosted Drain Punch knocks it out in one shot. Volo's team was crushed, although we now had to deal with Giratina twice. But the good news is, my team was in solid shape, with five Pokemon still standing. I can't change my team around between battles, so I'm forced to lead with Lucario, who takes big damage from Earth Power. A Bulldoze gives me a second consecutive turn, and I use this to land a Dragon Pulse for solid damage. But sadly, another Earth Power from Giratina sends our beloved Lucario to the grave. But its sacrifice was not in vain, as at this range, Sneasel can finish Giratina with a strong style shadow. Claw. For the second phase, I had a plan revolving around my Pokemon in the back, but Giratina missed two attacks, allowing Sneasler to rip it to shreds with Shadow Claw. It did manage to land one Shadow Force, but Sneasler hung on, and one last Shadow Claw finally sent Giratina back to the Shadow Realm that it crawled out of. I had some luck there, but honestly, I didn't really need it. I still had plenty of firepower left, but with that, I'd conquered a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Legends Arceus using only fighting types. The Bulk Up and Drain Punch combo is busted, but I had a lot of fun Nuzlocking this game. For more Monotype Nuzlocke challenges, check out this playlist. If you enjoyed the video, all that I ask is that you give it a like and subscribe to the channel. It's totally free, quick, and really helps me out. Earlier I asked you to let me know what your favorite fighting type was in the comments. For me, it's Inferno. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.